Well, here we are again, folks. Brother Peter, tidbits from the Word. Do you know that to be a soul winner, first thing you need to know is that you're saved. One of the best tools that I've used in soul winning is the fact in 1972, I was a full-fledged alcoholic. And for the week, weekend, one long weekend, got drunk, and uh, uh, I guess it was, uh, uh, it had to be Sunday morning because it was uh, 2 o'clock Saturday night, so it was 2 o'clock Sunday morning that God touched my heart. I wrecked my car and he touched my heart and he said, your number's up. Either you ask me right now to save you or I'm not going to ask you again. I'm not coming after you anymore. I'm going to write you off. I've been dealing with you for years and you've refused, but your number's up now. It's your time. I just looked up to heaven. I said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Come in my heart and save my soul. That's how easy salvation is. The majority of people, though, need somebody to say that to them. But I wasn't in part of the majority. I was in the minority end because I was raised around Christian folks. Because I knew about God. I had deliberately rejected Him on purpose. And therefore, when he come after me, he came after me with a purpose. And this purpose was either you get it now or you ain't going to get it. Well, everybody's not the same. But when we're soul winning, we need to be very gentle. We need to be careful. Our best thing is, is to have some kind of way to break communication. I use a track. I have these tracks in my pocket. And this is what I use. This is how I break the ice with most people. I say... Uh, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? If there's any kind of hesitation in their answer, the answer is usually no. If there's some kind of hesitation. So what we want to do is make get the hesitation away and be clear with them that we are saved, that we're Christians, that we're going to heaven when we die. So I usually break the ice by saying, well, I'm an evangelist out of faith, and I do a little thing on YouTube here. After we talk, uh, if you look at it sometime, look at our website. We've got a good website, good college. But the question is, is if you died right now, would you meet Jesus? Would you go to heaven? And that's the question. And if there's any hesitation, you need to enter in to the picture that is inside of this folder which says this, God's word's very clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. I didn't really have to be that drunk and thief and person I was to be a sinner. I could have been a very good person. Didn't lie, cheat, steal, didn't do any of that. Just didn't believe in God. And so it was just the other way around with me, though. I was the worst. So God, God's word is very clear. It's very clear to us. Mankind has sinned before the righteous God. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory. We can't deny that. And for the wages, that's payment. The wages for sin is death. And, and, and sin brought death aboard. You remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden and Eve sinned and pass it on to Adam. That's the wages of sin. But God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He had died for me some 2,000 years in that, at that time, about 16, 1,500 years before and when I got saved. And, and, and for me, he had died for me to save me. But God commended his love to us while we're yet sinners. He died for us. Romans 5 and 8. God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, died for our sins so that you and I wouldn't have to pay that penalty. And it's a gift. It says here in Romans 6 and 23, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus when he died on the cross, he was wrapping the gift of salvation for you and I. And the day that he was born, he was the gift 
that you and I had given to us. And then, as he died on the cross, he wrapped that gift up and said, here's the Holy Spirit I'm sending you. It will come live in you. And you will be in me and I will be in you. And we can live together on the earth and you can be a witness of me. He said that if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Let's go back to that word thou for a second. In the Bible days when he said you, he said thou. Nowadays we say you. You, hey you, go to the store for me. Hey you, do this. Hey you, do that. And back in those days he said thou. And so we see this. He said if you uh, will confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's anybody, anywhere, anytime. Some people differ uh, with this statement, but you could be a, a, the, the, a murderer. You could be in prison. A preacher comes and preaches. You've never heard the word. You've never had the opportunity to reject Jesus. Nobody ever told you. You lived in a heathen house and a heathen place and all you studied was heathen and you never heard the gospel. And a man comes in and he tells you the gospel. You can say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul and you can go to heaven when you die. You say, but what about all that? You killed a bunch of people. You did this, you did that. That's all behind you. That's all behind you. God forgives all sin. All. A-L-L. -L, all of it. No, mankind can't. Mankind won't. Mankind keeps it in his mind and in his conscience and in his life and say, man, I, yeah, I don't think it's right for that man to go to heaven. He killed these other people. Well, if he killed Christians, he sent them to heaven earlier. But if they weren't Christians, they went to hell earlier. And I think the biggest sin would be to send them to hell earlier than to send them to heaven earlier. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever is you or me. We are whosoever's. And God never intended for salvation to be difficult or hard. So he offers it to us. And my question to you today is if you've never said this, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe He was the Son of God? Do you believe He could be your Savior today if you said, God, I am a sinner, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul? Well, He will. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, and save my soul. In Jesus' name, I pray. That's all you have to pray. That's the end of it. Then you become perfectly clean. It's called born again. You know, when you were born from your mother's womb, there was not a sin. There was nothing put against you. Nothing. When you were that, that brand new baby, there was nothing against you. And when you become a brand new Christian, there's nothing against you. You're clean, totally clean. So I would say to you, if you've asked the Lord to save you, welcome to the family. Look at our other websites on there. If you're on PH Tidbits, look at the other websites at LaGrange, uh, faithlagrange.com. That's LaGrange, Georgia. And you can find it. And there's also Titus Baptist Seminary. That's a seminary. That's a, I, I went to that school myself, graduated. It's a seminary that is uh, for you and for anybody else who wants to learn the Bible and it's on the YouTube and it's free to you it's the only thing you may maybe need to do is buy some books and some few things good lessons good lessons good lessons there let's take a look at something here what else must I do to be saved nothing man of his own self can do nothing to please God except ask Jesus to forgive him of his sin, commend his heart, and save his soul. Then he can please God with the things he does after that. 
But there's nothing else he can do. It's in the Lord Jesus. Ah, whosoever, whosoever, he said, how great is the mercy of God. As the heaven is higher above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. When did I get the fear of the Lord? 30 years old. At 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, I got the fear of the Lord in me and asked him to forgive me of my sin and come in my heart and save my soul. That's what I needed. The protection that I get. He is a shield of faith now for me. The devil can't just come at will and jump on me anymore. He has to get permission from God to do that. And I have to recognize when he does that. So uh, God is able, he said, to quench all the fiery darts that are cast at us by the devil. Ephesians 6 and 16. That's in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians written to them by Paul the Apostle who knew they were going to face conflict. And he said, you're going to face conflict. The devil's throwing darts at you. The devil's going to test you. He's going to try you. So, how do I get God's help when this happens? This is how I get it. Uh, we go to Philippians 4, 6 and 7. In everything, by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. That's like eating a good meal. And... You say blessing over the meal. You say, God bless this food I'm about to eat. And you eat it. And then you get nourishment from it. He said, let your request be made known unto God. You've got to let your request be made known unto God. And then your hearts and your minds, in, in your heart and mind, and then the peace of God will give you, he will pass all understanding. He'll give you the understanding you need. And the peace of God will give you that. And then we are assured of God's great power in redemption. Uh, the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead was God the Father. Jesus was God the Son. You say... You're saying that Jesus was God. Yeah, they were both God. There was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are God. If you had one, you had the other. And I am a me, myself, and I. What is that? I'm three people in one. God and Jesus were talking, and Jesus said to God, and God said to Jesus, Hey, I think we're thinking the same thing, and the Holy Spirit agreed. Well, let's go down and make man in our own image. And our image will make man. He will be a body, he will be a soul, and he will be a spirit. Nobody's ever seen God and lived, the Bible said. He showed a hind apart little speck to Moses, and he shined like a light. If he had shown him any more, he'd have, he would have uh, self-destructed. And so... Uh, nobody's seen God in person unless you've seen Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <laughs> so what is he saying? He's saying, I am God. I was God. I was God in the flesh. I came down in the flesh to, to prove a point to you folks down here that you can have the Holy Spirit, you can have me in you, and I will be in you, and you will be in God, and you will be in me. And the Holy Spirit will be in you. And we're going to talk before we're done a little bit here about being fishes of men. We become fishers of men. Jesus, when he called the disciples, he said, that you fish for fish out here in the ocean no more. You won't need your nets anymore. You'll need a new net. You'll need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And that's a net that won't let the big fish through and won't let the little fish through. And so that's a good net. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so great is his mercy to them that fear him. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Just being a human being, you need the mercy of God. Just being a human being, you need the mercy of God. We are frail human beings. We tend to uh, fall away or walk far off or not stay where we need to stay. Now that you're saved, if you're saved, you need to make a personal plan that would be uh, worthy of sainthood. You are now a saint of God. And if you're a saint of God, that means in the heavenly places up there, already positionally, you have a saintly robe on. And God wants you to wear that saintly robe down here just as much as possible. So that when you walk up to somebody, you really haven't got to say anything. You, many, many, many times when I open my mouth, people say, I, I knew that. I already felt that. How about that? I love the fact that it's not this old wretched soul right here that is righteous, but it's the God that's inside of me that's righteous. If I get close enough to Him, He'll show His righteousness and He'll show His Spirit to people before you even speak to Him. It's called an aura. If you can live close enough to God, you can have an aura. We have some people in our church that have auras. I can look up in the choir and I can point you out a man or two with an aura. It's like a halo. I think back in the Bible days when they were painting some of the pictures they painted, they painted this halo around Jesus all the time. I know that's a Catholic thing. But on the other hand, I think there probably were some people back in that day that lived close enough to God that when they saw a man that was a godly man, they could see that ring around his head. They could see the Holy Spirit hovering over that man like Jesus, God said, I will hover over you in the desert with a cloud during the day to keep you from burning up. Then when you get saved, I will be that spirit that hovers over you and keeps you from harm. I'll be that spirit that lives in you and keeps you from that the wicked one. And then at night, what did God do? He was a spirit of fire. He had this flame of fire over there. Where did God dwell? He dwelled in there. Cloud in the daytime. He dwelled in that fire at night. He also dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant that was there inside of the tabernacle. He also said, Jesus said, they had a rock in the wilderness that followed them for a couple hundred years and water came out of that rock. What? Drinking water. Pure water came out of that rock. Jesus said, I was that rock. I was that rock in the desert that gave you fresh water to drink, that kept you physically alive. I was that water. Jesus had the ability to be what God would have him be. He was the Son of God. And what did, what did God say when uh, John the Baptist baptized Jesus? God said, out of heaven. The heavens opened up and God spoke. This is one time he was heard audibly. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. That's one time that God spoke with audible words. 
Other times that he spoke in the Old Testament, there was thunder, lightning, crashing, and no audible words. <laughs> and so, uh, but when he, he spoke with audible words, was the only place is when he said, this is my beloved son. And look, we need to use the word often. Can we love a person who is a full-fledged sinner? We better love them. God loved me when I was a full-fledged sinner. Other people loved me when I was a full-fledged sinner. They, they prayed for me. That's what got me through. That's what brought me in. That's what kept me alive for 30 years. And so love begins at the house of God and it's passed on through the years. It's not too late to become a Christian if you can breathe. If you can take a breath, in and out, inhale and exhale, can you do that? It's not too late to become a Christian. When you inhale, say, Lord. When you exhale, say, forgive me. Forgive me. When you inhale, say, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Come in my heart and save my soul and cleanse me from that sin. And then thank you, Jesus, for doing that. That's how simple it is. You can do that in a jailhouse, laying on a, the rack. You can do that in the service in a submarine laying on the rack. You can do that in the uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, or wherever, laying on a rack. You can do it on the side, on the, hanging off the side of a ship. You can do it flying in the air in the Air Force. You can do it on a, a small uh, boat if you're in the Coast Guard. There is nowhere that you can't get Jesus into your heart. If you hear this word today, no matter where you are, if you hear this, you can say, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I come in my heart and say, I'm sorry. That's all there is to it. God made it easy. He made it easy enough so a man that can't read or write can do it. If he hadn't made it that easy, there would have been millions of people before school systems came in that would have not been able to read or write or say that. You know, just because a man couldn't read or write didn't make him dumb. <laughs> I have to look in the mirror and say that. Because I have a, a, a dry, big, big drawback on reading and writing. But I've had to try to overcome it, and I have tried to overcome it. Well, a guy says, you know, I, I ain't been good enough. No, you haven't. And I don't care how hard you work at it, good works won't get you to heaven. You can't be good enough, and you never will be good enough. After you're saved, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says... After he comes in your heart, he will lead you, he will guide you, and he'll show you how to have that spiritual righteousness that you don't have if you're, you're not there. What purpose was it that Christ came? He came for you and I, First Timothy. In First Timothy, he says this, 1 through 15. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And Timothy knew he was a chief of sinners at one time. Paul knew he was a chief of sinners at one time. Peter knew he was a chief of sinners at one time. There were 11 apostles that came through that all of them knew they were chief of sinners at one time. There was one named Judas who was a chief of sinners too, but he did not admit it. 
He did not say, God, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart, save my soul. He could have denied Jesus. The soldiers could have came and crucified Jesus. And if he had have said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, he would have gone to heaven. He didn't have to die and go to hell. He died and went to hell because he was stubborn. Because he was full of rebellion. Because the devil had got in him. And so, no, he could have repented and went to heaven. What is the extent of Christ's power? He is able also to save them to the uttermost. We crossed that word a few minutes ago. What is the uttermost? That's the worst man that ever lived. That's the worst the worst killer on this earth that's ever been noted if before he died he said God forgive me of my sin come in my heart and save my soul if he hadn't already been sealed to hell and he said that he went to heaven some people who have done these great murders and things all have sealed themselves they rejected God the last time God came to them. That's where I, the doorstep I was on at 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972. That's the doorstep I was standing on. Had I not said, God forgive me. Now, salvation is by faith. The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. After you're saved, you need some personal teaching in order for you to be able to go out and win other souls. How do you find that? You find that in the Bible. You find that by getting into God's Word. I don't know where you are or who you are watching this, but who you are or wherever you are, if you're interested in this, find you a church. I personally go to a Baptist church. Why? Because they do not deny the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Some churches deny them. They, did you know that? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died, he went to the cross, and he died. He went to the grave, and he rose again the third day and went to be with the Father. And there's ten times more proof that he rose again and went to be with the Father than there is that he didn't raise. There is no proof that he did not raise from the grave. The truth of the matter is he did. And he was sane of many, many people. Just at one little time he was seen of 120. And they all witnessed this arm. All 120. And that he filled them with the Holy Spirit. And they went out and won many souls. That's one of the tools that you have to have. You have to have the Holy Spirit in your tool bag. When He comes in your heart, He drives the other spirit out and He comes in. Another thing we need in our tool bag as we step forward to try to win other people is we have to know that the promises of the Bible are for you and I. And we receive them in us and then we can pass them on. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That's an Old Testament statement from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. But it's the most truthful statement in the New Testament also as it's repeated. You want God's guidance and God's power every step of the way? Then therefore you must claim this verse and keep it in your heart and keep you intimate with Him, with God, through Jesus Christ. There's no time that you want to break fellowship with Him. This is our Lord's own term. Jesus Standing on the shore of Galilee, he really called some fishermen from their boats. And Nets had said, Him, 
to his disciples, he told them he would make them fishers of men. Boy, isn't it hard to believe that Jesus walked by and said to these guys, a couple of them that were brothers, they were fishing for their daddy on their daddy's boat, and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They laid their daddy's net down, they got off the boat, and they walked away and they followed Jesus and never went back to the boat. They left their earnings, their place of earnings, they left everything by faith and followed Jesus. I don't believe it. Nary one of them ever went without a meal. I believe they didn't have to go without a meal at that period of time in their life. I think later on in life, they probably had to go without a meal or two, just as we've had to. And that's part of the course when you're following Jesus. The devil don't like you. And he's going to do everything he can, every way he can, to try to keep you from doing what you need to do and be what you need to be. So anyway, my time's come and gone. Put the tools in your tool bag that you need to be fisher of men. Put that rod of salvation you got. Put that reel of the spiritual line of knowing the scriptures that you need. And put the hook of prayer on there. And ask God to reel in some souls for you. The closer you get to the Lord and the more you study in His Word in that line, in the line of being a fisher of men, the better you will become at it. Well, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.